And um, I, I'm going to tell you the Australian XF story, or some of it, um, and, and focus on three parts. The past, sort of how we got to where we are, where we are now, and, um, and where we're all going. So I guess we, we'll say that we had humble beginnings. Our first user community um, sort of happened through collaborations, uh, mostly with people from Sydney University in the bio field, collaborating with people from probably SSRL. And at the same time, there was seen, uh, foreseen the need for Australian access to um, a synchrotron beamline at least. And so what occurred was the, the Australian National Beamline Facility um, was formed and that was a, a generous donation from the photon factory of a bend magnet port uh, and then we then um, built a beamline and that beamline was pretty much a general purpose beamline it was quite simple um, so no mirrors um, just a monochromator and some slits and then you can see the, the top photo there there's a, a dip, big diffractometer called the big diff uh, that was used for diffraction and small angle scattering, surface scattering, all these kind of things. And then behind that, there's a simple table for excess. So for many years, it was just transmission. Um, then eventually it was a, a small fluorescence detector, uh, then a cryostat. Uh, and then eventually we had a, a 36 element pixel array, which is now with us back in Melbourne. So that the beamline ran for about 20 years. Um, and out of that, there was probably 1,400 experiments, mostly Australian, many hundreds of publications, including about 35 publications per year of EXAFs. So sort of by the, the mid or the early 2000s, there was a, a reasonably established um, EXAFs community operating uh, up in Japan. <clears throat> so for people who needed more flux, so more flux than 10 to the 9 photons per second, for example, um, there was still a strong um, direction that we would go and get beam time at, at SSRL and use the Wiggler beam lines. And what's really of note here is that the ANBF is pr pretty much the first beam line that many of the current Australian synchrotron beam line staff ever used. And um, you can see the picture of Gary Foran up there that many of the Asian colleagues will, will probably remember. Um, he was the one who really got XAPS going up in the ANBF and can lay credit to a lot of the community's development that we have. And so from that, there was recognised that Australia needed a synchrotron and, and pretty much um, the, we call the XAFS, XAS beamline. So it was the, one of the first four beamlines, the first five beamlines that was funded and, and built. Um, and that came online uh, in around 2007 with the Australian synchrotron. You can see the Australian synchrotron here and you can see a picture inside the, the hutch of the, of the beamline. So we have uh, a wiggler behind the, the wall, um, a very large water-cooled collimating mirror, a uh, cryo-cooled double crystal monochromator, and then a, a focusing mirror. So it was a, a focusing beamline, uh, it was high power and big energy range. <clears throat> so we, wanted the, we were actually the first beamline to get beam on sample. Uh, I said it was a Wiggler beamline. So uh, the critical energy here is 12 kV compared to 4 kV at the photon factory. So we, can, we could cover a much higher energy range with more flux. But with that, there's two kilowatts of power to manage, which of course makes it tricky for energy stability and stuff like that, as we all know. Uh, at the time, it was a completely turnkey supplied beamline. Uh, and the monochromator at that time had a stability or vibrational stability of about 400 nanoradians. Um, as I said, it was focused and with very high flux. And so whilst it was great for, for some samples, um, for some samples, it wasn't so great. For example, uh, the large, simple, low flux density beam at, that we had in the AMBF, we, didn't, we couldn't really cater for, for experiments that really needed that. Um, so to manage the power and the harmonic content, we had multiple mirror modes, which means that the beam line has a fair bit of uh, changing uh, to go between different energy ranges, which we don't actually let the, the users do because of the power load. Uh, we have two experimental hutches. One is a, a, a setup that's um, usually kept stationary um, for people to doing routine transmission fluorescence measurements. Uh, and another hutch that um, people can um, optimize and bring their own experiments, um, for example. 
we do have a 100 element pixel array, which we've had since 2009, and that's really been the staple of most of the, the, the Beamline success. So just to, to note that the big success that we did have with the, the original monochromator was the very good uh, energy reproducibility and stability. So typically over the full energy range on a silicon 111 scan, um, or over the full range, we would have around 0.25 EB uh, accuracy. So um, that's typically better than an XF scan. So we were really happy with that. And you know, the, the typical copper foil data, um, really nice reproducibility. Again, a copper foil um, is not so sensitive to, to beam stability. And if you have a non-homogeneous sample, then we, we, we probably did one a little bit better than that. What's worth noting is that um, from the Australian context, any Australian user that gets beam time with us gets travel and accommodation for three people for their experiment. And so this was about um, being able to build a community and, and have, because we're a large country, have fair access for, for everybody. So in the, I said we have two hutches. Um, in, the, in the main hutch where we do most of the experiments, these are the sort of typical sample environments we have. Um, the cryostat, which is really a bread and butter of, of what we do for XAFs. Um, this room temperature holder, which we have a number of, which we can do different things. So we can do inoperando uh, experiments in there. If we have a solution cell, we'll mount it in there. Uh, we have a furnace for, for heating. Uh, and we also use, or we borrow actually a, a capillary heater, um, which tends to get a, a fair bit of work, a fair bit of use. For the more non-standard or the more complex setups, we have this, what we call the hutch C. So you can see it on the, on the right here, the, there's pretty much a full hutch. Sometimes we have an experimental table which can be moved. Um, so on the left here, you can see that this is the, called the, the Maestro uh, hydrothermal cell. So this is a, uh, a cell that they look at hydrothermal solution studies up to about 600 bar and 600 degrees. Uh, on the right here, um, it's actually a high pressure press. So it's a deformation dyer press. So um, not, not only can you apply straight pressure, but you can also apply pressure and then a deformation or a twist. And so the setup here is to do um, transmission XFs and also a, a, an energy dispersive uh, diffraction measurement. So in 2015, we got a, a boost. We, um, we raised the, the funds internally to upgrade the monochromator. And we went with a, an IDT air bearing. So, you know, Matt, Matt Newville will remember the time I came over to the APS to really check his out and see how good it was. And, and look, we're really, really happy with this um, DCM. Again, it's a cryo-cooled silicon 1113 monochromator. Um, but what we've really improved is the, the stability because the, the monochromator doesn't really vibrate. And so we can measure the whole beamline has a, um, a stability of around between 50 and 75 nanoradian. And we, we can't measure it to any better than that. But so that's the whole beamline. And what we're actually really pushing is, of course, this slew scanning, this fast scanning. Uh, and, and we've been developing that for a while. And where, we, where our limitation actually is, is the getting the control system up to standard so we can like reliably do this. But it, within the next cycle or so, we really expect to be um, offering this. And we, we expect, we probably don't expect the experiments to um, shorten, but we expect the range of what people can do within their time to be uh, increased and are, are enhanced. In terms of the science profile that we see, this is on, on the XF beamline. So we have to remember that we went from a, a, a large non-focused low flux density beam to a high flux density beam. And, and the Wiggler beamline was actually, the, the, the user community was very strongly in the bio XF field. Um, in, the, in the previous 10 years, we've seen a strong shift out of that. Oh, one of the titles is, is missing here. Um, but this is energy materials. So when we started energy materials and catalysts, we didn't have anyone in the user community doing this. This was really the bio um, XS field, which has really dropped down over the years. Um, it's good that we're seeing this strong growth in the community. So the, 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 and what we're seeing is that the, the science is really following the, the key targets of the beamline. So it's really to do this ultra dilute type Fluorescence, fluorescence measurements to cater for uh, inoperando experiments. Um, 
And then the goals that we have is really to um, maintain the performance of that. So we, we're looking at a uh, detector, detector upgrade to the 100 element detector very soon. Um, and also the speed, so the fast scanning. And then um, forthcoming, we have um, a crystal spectrometer that we're planning as well. And that's really to use the flux of this, this beamline. Um, in terms of the scientific areas, as I said, energy materials is a real area that's um, growing for us. Uh, and typically we have a lot of strong uh, community in the earth and the environmental and the geoscience. Um, we, we see around 50, uh, 60 experiments per year. We're averaging around 50 publications per year. So that's pretty good, we think, one, roughly one paper for one publication. And the average impact factor has slowly grown. And I think we're the second or the third um, highest impact, average impact factor beamline. But the, the key point to know is that we're three times oversubscribed. So, um, and, and that's really good. We've gone from a community, established community at AMBF, we went to the Wiggler beamline, the community has then grown, we're now three times oversubscribed, uh, and it's time to, to do more things. So just quickly, some, uh, just some science examples, which don't really show the, the breadth of what we do, but some key um, achievements was really uh, looking at arsenic in rice. And so the arsenic concentration was around about 100 ppb. Now this, is, this paper is a few years old now, um, and it was really the first time that we were able to do something um, which, with such low concentration. Um, what was key was having a really stable DCM and also the 100 element um, fluorescence detector. Where typically now, these are the sort of experiments that we see. A lot of um, battery technology where they're doing uh, in operando with their, their battery, driving charge and discharge, and then for example, looking at the structural changes um, with the, the discharge and charge cycle of the battery. So this is, a, I think, a molybdenum um, case in a battery, and we, we, we really see a lot of good publications in this area. So that's my first pause. Very good. Um, that's a great start. I'll ask people to type in their questions. Um, one question for you. You mentioned the uh, scientific community. Uh, different synchrotrons have different profiles in terms of possible involvement of industrial users. Uh, what's the situation with the Australian synchrotron in your beam line? So we, we've had sporadic uh, industrial use. Um, we may see of the order of one experiment per year. Um, it is something that we have a charge to go out and really um, foster. Um, and, and it does vary as to um, what's happening locally. So at the start, we did have a fair bit of mining uh, industrial use, um, and then we had some biotech use. But you know, again, it's it's not a, it's not the strongest aspect of the community. I see. Um, uh, among your present user base, for whom is the focusing capability most important? And is there part of your user base that wishes you had an undulator instead of a wiggler to be able to get uh, a focal spot? Yeah. So. Um, so we do have a X-ray fluorescence microprobe um, beamline at the Australian Synchrotron, which is an undulator-based beamline, which has a, a regular two micron KB focus. Um, because they're undulator-based, um, the spectrum and, and the way they work, they're really set up for very high speed, high throughput mapping. Um, the spectroscopy isn't as good as obviously what we can do on the Wiggler. So I think the having the Wiggler and the very tunable um, energy background that we have give, allows us to get the really high quality um, data. Uh, yes, some people want a smaller spot and, and we'll get to that. Okay. All right, um, you should continue, thank you. Okay. So not only do they want a smaller spot, but they want a bigger spot. Uh, and so pretty much because of the success that we've had, and I think from this plot, we can see the, num the average number of publications per beamline from, from the Australian Synchrotron compared to other facilities, we do punch uh, above our weight. And that was strong justification to get money to build more uh, beamlines. So um, 
a couple of years ago, we got $80 million from a consortium of funding partners to build these eight new beam lines. So um, the first two or the first three beam lines that are being built are the microcomputed tomography and then uh, two more medium energy X-ray absorption spectroscopy beam lines, which is where, where the talk's going. And this is actually what we're talking about, about the future of XAPS. So there's a couple of things. Um, the current beam line is 5 kV and above, and it misses all these beautiful elements that are pretty prevalent in human biology. There's also um, a lot of the transition uh, metal elements as well. And, and some of these bio type samples uh, don't benefit at all from the wiggler and the focus beam because of radiation damage. So the users wanted the ability to go to lower energies to study these key bio biological interest in elements like phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, potassium. Uh, they wanted a larger beam, surprise it or not, so that radiation damage is less of a problem and they wanted a microprobe. So that's what we did. <clears throat> so the, the science that we're focusing on these new beam lines is again prioritizing human health and biology, uh, the agriculture and plants, but still supporting the, um, the science areas that are really going well on XIS. And, and how we do this and how we're going to do this is by offering the low energy range, which we can't currently get to, we're going to give a largest bending magnet beam, which is great for the transition metal elements and the radiation sensitive samples, samples that don't really need um, a lot of flux that we have elsewhere. Uh, we're going for enhanced specificity. I said it right, good. Uh, and so that's with a, a herft mainly a herf d crystal analyzer spectroscopy uh, spectrometer uh, and also we're going for high quality micro spectroscopy so I, I, I say it that way because it's a microprobe on a bend magnet so it's not going to be the highest flux as a microprobe on an undulator um, but because we have the, the bend magnet the aim is to get from sulfur to selenium on the same sample and this is roughly what it looks like so it's actually two independent beam lines off a bending magnet source. There's what we call uh, MEX2, which is the low energy beam line. And we have a, a mirror in the front end bouncing the beam sideways and another mirror in the beam line bouncing it sideways, just so we can get a separation between the, the main beam line and the other beam line. So this is MEX2. So MEX2 is a low energy beam line. It's a collimated beam of around three to five millimeters. Uh, it's this lower energy range and the energy range here is really driven by um, the limitation of the mirror stripe. So we had to pick a mirror stripe that would give us good harmonic rejection in that region. Uh, the requirement was to get silicon. So that meant that uh, if you use an indium antimonide monochromatic crystal to get the silicon, then you, you have a second harmonic problem. So it's sort of, it makes sense to limit the energy range to about three and a half kV here. Uh, the end station is quite simple with either a helium or a vacuum environment, and I'll talk about that later. The other beam line, which is the main beam line, is a, a conventional collimating mirror, monochromator, uh, focusing mirror arrangement. Uh, and then there's a sample, uh, an end station, and then a KB mirror end station as well. So um, we do, we fo we're actually offering various focus sizes, but we're going to do it very simply by not needing to change mirror heights and monochromata, monochromata heights. It's all going to happen by translating um, mirrors and monochromaters sideways, which we have experience in and we know that we can do that reliably. Uh, the energy range is down to 2.1 up to 13.6 keV. Uh, and, and really this is dictated by phosphorus to sulfur. Sulfur is a very important element for, for our community. Um, our lesson learned from our beamline and also experience from, for example, SSRL is where mostly they have in their monochromators two crystals so that you, you can actually move the glitch profile around, which we found is really important for, for normalization. Um, we, we, on this beamline, we're offering standard XAS, of course, um, a high resolution spectrometer and a microprobe. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So there's, a, there's an optics enclosure here, which has the main MEX1 beamline, so a mirror, a monochromator, and a mirror. Uh, the MEX2 beamline is bounced sideways, of course, and that runs along there. And, and we are able to actually have a monochromator outside the radiation enclosure. So we can have uh, the monochromator and the MEX2 experiment chamber here within the user environment. Uh, and then we have the main MEX1 beamline where we have a, 
our main table with our main experiment on it. And then behind it, we have the, um, the microprobe station. And again, a sample area and then the user area. So for the, the next one, end stations, so this is the, that we call the medium energy station. So we, we will use this for about three and a half to 13.6. Again, three and a half for harmonic rejection. We're aiming for a variable um, height beam. So we can change that with the focusing of the mirror between 0.2 and 0.7 mil. And then uh, horizontally, the beam won't be focused generally. So we slip down the size of the beam that we want. Um, so we have a, a typical setup, slits, iron chambers, uh, cryostat. This is, a, this is actually a flowing cryostat with a helium recirculator. So we, we, again, we, we prefer to have very low vibrations. Uh, and the, the different thing that we've done here is we're mounting the, um, the vortex detector that we've chosen right into the cryostat itself to minimize the window and the air, air absorption. So we can get down to those low energies efficiently. Then we'll have a setup for where we do our room temperature type measurements with, again, with its own um, fluorescence detector. Uh, we have a station for the, the crystal spectrometer, again, with a, a, a cryostat as well. This is not a fast exchange cryostat because the measurements are longer. Uh, we have a reference wheel, uh, and then we actually, then we have our microprobe station after the main beam line. So when we use the microprobe, of course, we can run the beam straight through the table, or we can just move it sideways and put a flight tube in. Um, a key point of the design has been not to um, change the beam height at the, at the experiment. Um, the microprobe is, as I said before, the aim is to do sulfur and selenium on the same sample, and they mean at the same time. So, you know, thanks guys. Um, the iron chambers that we're using here are gridded iron chambers, so we can uh, take the advantage to scan fast. Um, and then I want to move on. So we're calling um, the, the crystal spectrometer Spectromex, and um, this is mostly going to be used for HERF D, so um, high resolution uh, detection, but for sharpening the zanes. And I, I, it's always hard to discuss that quickly, so I won't. Um, the, uh, we bought the IP from ESRF to their specifications for their spectrometer. So um, you can see that there, and we went out to Beard and, and uh, Huber has won that uh, bid to build that for us, and that's currently underway. Um, we will be sticking to a half meter Roland geometry. Um, of course, buying the crystals that you need to cover the different energy ranges is always uh, quite expensive. So we, we have a, a strategy on how to manage that. Um, it's designed to be compatible with our sampler environments and our cryostat. Um, and uh, the other key thing to notice is we've designed this so we can initially transport it between different beam lines should we need to. So the plan for this is to actually commission it on the Wiggler beam line um, where they've got space to and there's more flux before we move it into to the next beam line. Now, the reason that this was put on this beam line was to take advantage of a non-focused beam for the bio type samples. Um, clearly, uh, having such a spectrometer on the focus beam line, the wiggle beam line, will be very useful as well. Uh, in terms of the microprobe, so um, we don't want to compete with the existing microprobe that we have, which is highly successful. So what we're aiming to really do here is we're, we're aiming to function on the spectroscopic quality of doing our um, uh, doing our spectroscopy with a small spot but we're not going to rule out two different ways of doing it so if you can imagine having a, a sample and different pixels on the sample we're still going to support two ways of measuring so one is to do what we what we, what we call a zane stack so that would be um, keeping the energy of the monochromator fixed and then scanning your sample around and then changing the energy and scanning your sample around versus the other way to do it, where you do a map of the sample and then you, two, you take a particular spot and then you change your energy of your monochromator uh, and you do a Zane scan. This type of technique is what's highly used at the, the X-ray fluorescence microprobe and a lot of the community really love. Um, this is more the, the spectroscopist approach uh, and we've got the community that wants to be able to do both. In terms of the, the specifications, uh, we're going for two to five, oh, sorry, this should be two to five, micron. Um, it approximately works out to be about 10 to the 9 um, photons per second. Um, 
we're going for a helium ambient temperature. And what's a little bit different is that we want sample cooling and, and we, we're going to use a, a helium cryostream. So a traditional cryostream, but blowing helium gas rather than nitrogen gas um, through that. Um, we're going to be able to have, uh, we've got a three element vortex detector that we've ordered and we'll have a Pilatus detector for um, transmission. So I mentioned that um, we're going to use a cryo, um, a cryojet for cooling. And this is actually was prototyped or an, and actually used on the, this is the XFM beam line at the Australian Synchrotron, where they have been using uh, a Pilatus, uh, sorry, a cryo stream to do uh, cooling of their samples. And so this is what it looks like. So they've got a little capped on foil covering, their detector, the cryo stream um, cooling under the sample. And yes, they've tested. Does it degrade uh, spectral quality? So this was probably more a concern um, because they're using nitrogen gas and you know, uh, pressure, local pressure fluctuations of the nitrogen gas could potentially create extra noise and distort the, the X-apps that you measured. Um, so if you see that the, the pink curve is the, the X-apps that they measured um, at XFM and they took the same sample and did a bulk measurement at, at XAS beamline at 10 Kelvin and you can see that they reasonably well uh, agree with each other. Now I'm moving into the, the MEX 2 end station. And um, this is the, the low energy uh, end station. So it's 1, 1.7, so for silicon up to about three and a half kV. And, and here the idea is to make this rather simple. Um, it's, a, it's a vacuum chamber that can either be under vacuum of about 10 to minus six or, um, or, or vacuum. So it's sort of UHV type um, manipulator. It's a, the, fl the fluorescence detector mounted into the vacuum system um, with a fast loading sample, uh, fast loading door, which we can load a stick of say 10 samples. Um, we, we actually did an evaluation of the fluorescence detectors that suited us best, um, looking at what was out there in the community or from vendors. And we've gone for, for the um, silicon drift detectors with square elements. So we really minimize the, um, the 90 degree um, off axis low scatter um, area. Um, what's unique about this setup is we've gone for a very compact crystal spectrometer. So we're aiming here for, for pretty much to do, uh, again, HERF-D to sharpen up the fluorescence to get um, better absorption data. So this is actually um, based on um, the type of design that comes from Jerry's group. Um, and it works on the dispersive refocusing roll on geometry. So, so this is, uh, the idea here is that you have your sample not on the, uh, the roll on circle like you would with a typical um, roll, on roll on circle type spectrometer, but you put your sample uh, midway in the range and allows you to then use a large beam to illuminate the detector and have the energy separation on the detector. Um, I am not going to explain this in much detail because I'll do a poor job of it. So if people have questions for this, I'm, I'm happy to palm that off to Jerry. Um, but the point is that it's relatively insensitive to the beam spot size. It uses um, a 10 centimeter radius crystal, which is quite small. It offers quite good resolution for phosphorus and sulfur. And that's actually what we're really targeting. This, uh, this particular beamline, we're targeting to do sulfur very, very well. Um, we had Easy X apps, the company that makes the, the brimstone uh, spectrometer involved in the, in the concept. Um, and it, and we, we are using their inexpensive CMOS detector, which we need to test under vacuum. So this is the, the paper that, that pretty much described the, the concept of what we're using. And we have an engineer who looked at this and thought, rather than do it all mechanically, I'm gonna come up with a clever mechanical mechanism to allow you to do our energy changes in vacuum or in, in helium. So this is his um, prototype of the mechanism. He hasn't, <clears throat> he hasn't designed the detailed mechanics yet, um, but we, we're pretty happy about this because, you know, when you talk to engineers and you say, yeah, users are gonna stick their hands in and we're gonna change crystals and screw uh, a mount on, the engineers are just like, you know, no, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't wanna see that happening. So this is my second pause, Jerry. Oh, I love that animation. What a, what a very nice design. Um, all right, um, to begin, there was a question to uh, 
clarify that the MEX-1 and MEX-2 beam lines will be able to run experiments simultaneously? Yeah, they're two independent beam lines. So yes, um, we will have users on both beam lines at the same time. I see. What kind of um, uh, special environments do you think would go into this small vacuum chamber or would more likely just be uh, bulk samples? So we're starting with bulk samples. Um, in terms of people bringing uh, sam sample environments, that, that we, we will have heating, we'll have cooling, um, uh, and that's going to be up for users to develop. So we are not uh, ruling that out. Um, we will have, you know, feed throughs and, and things like this where we will be able to put stuff on. We, we just haven't, um, we don't have the community developed to that point yet. So we've tried to be as uh, general as possible to support what will come. Um, I know we have been talking with um, Yong Feng from the CLS and he, his community is developed. They have many um, very nice sample holders, um, uh, cells and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, we, we will probably ask our users to leverage a little bit off him. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at with that. All right, uh, Matt Newville, you had a question, if you have a mic. Yeah, hi Chris. Um, hi, did, I, did I understand right that you had the, for the MX1 branch, or maybe for both branches, the monochromator was in the end station? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. So the, the low energy branch, the monochromator is in the end station um, because uh, if you do the radiation study, you, uh, you need a one mil of aluminium to pretty much uh, do the shielding right. So, so it's only for ME, MEX2? Okay. Uh, only for MEX2, yeah. So for MEX1, okay. Okay. The, the beam line is like a normal, uh, normal beam line with the mirrors and everything in a hutch, lead shielded, yep. Okay, great, thanks. Sorry, very good. Uh, you should continue and we'll have more questions at the end. Okay, so I'm nearly there. Um, so this is around our, our status. And of course, you know, everyone wants to know when are the beam lines gonna be operational? And, uh, and we were expecting to build, to start installation uh, later this year. And we we're expected to start user operations uh, in the middle of next year. Um, and most of our um, vendors uh, from, from overseas. So for example, the hutches are coming from Caratelli in France, the photon delivery system from Axelon in Germany, um, the monochromator from IDT in the UK. And, and then COVID came along and then all our borders are shut. And so we, we all need to work out how to, how to manage this uh, situation. So it's very difficult for us to predict, you know, exactly when uh, we're gonna, going to be ready. That's what, we, that's what we're busy working on right now. Uh, in terms of um, the beam line, we've pretty much procured all the major items. Um, we're at the stage of buying things like stages and, and amplifiers and electronics for, for the signal chain. So um, most of that is, is pretty much taken care of. Um, the thing that I want to highlight is that we've always had this idea in Australia that, you know, you, you, find, the, you find the demand and you build it and they will come. And I think that we've shown that um, going from the ANBF in Japan, uh, we built a community, we built a beam line, they came, they used it, we've expanded the community now um, so that we have, you know, we have the community to make use of these uh, new beam lines. And it also highlights the importance of actually having access to a local facility. So um, until a couple of days ago, I was going to be able to say that, you know, right now we are still open, we're still operating. Uh, and users can come and visit and do experiments. Now, actually, it's the most of the universities where the users are at, they're saying, you know, we don't want our staff to be traveling. Um, and, and, you know, with the COVID thing, we've, we've got a little local lockdown in Victoria at the moment, but it does highlight that, that research, you know, needs to go on and, and whether it's, whether you have access to a local facility because you can't do international travel um, or that we, we look at more um, supporting type of mail-in experiments and things like that. And that's something that I've never, never thought about um, in the past. So thank you everybody for tuning in and hearing about what we're doing in Australia. Um, I need to acknowledge the, the, the big team of people that have been working on this. So for example, the two scientists that are doing a great job with me is Jeremy and Simon, um, the whole build project team for the new beam lines. Um, particularly, you know, credit to, to Gary Foran, who really helped so many people get off 
up and running with XAFs in Australia um, from the AMBF days. Um, the, the current team on um, the XAS beamline. Uh, and then we have our advisory panel for the new beamlines chaired by um, Peter Lay. And lastly, people, I hope people aren't forgetting about this. So, um, you know, again, we would love to, we would love to see everybody in, uh, in Australia um, next year, but we'll, you know, we'll see, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, I know that the conference is considering what to do around remote access and things like this, and, and then um, you should hear announcements of that soon. So thank you everybody and I'm done. Thank you, Chris. It's a, a terrific overview. Um, um, a couple of questions for you as uh, other people start typing in their questions. Uh, first, um, uh, what fraction of your total user base uh, comes from outside Australia? Uh, not many. Okay. A, a small fraction, yeah. And, right. uh, and that's not that we don't allow foreigners to come. Um, we have... Um, you know, with our funding model, we have up to sort of 10% uh, discretionary use from, from foreign users. So we'll have the occasional um, foreign user, mostly from sort of Southeast Asia as well. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, uh, another question is uh, uh, trying to get a comparing and contrasting uh, Australian synchrotron with uh, the way that synchrotrons often operate in the US. So you mentioned that there was this uh, gradual transition from heavy bio users to heavy energy science users. Um, has there been any formal connection between the Beamline and, for example, uh, National Center for Energy Storage Research? Um, no, not. I mean, I don't even know if we have, if we have such a center in Australia because it's. You know, it's mostly people from, I mean, most of the energy work is coming from a few places. Uh -huh. um, and, and that's community that did grow. Um, you know, people that weren't necessarily XFs users that we went out and, and well, not me, but we, you know, went out and recruited to spectroscopy, did it by collaboration and have been very, very successful. Uh, it, it also potentially um, shows the, the shift in, um, you know, the impact of the science that people are doing in that area. So the, you know, the energy research is quite topical at the moment. They tend to score well in their proposals. Um, that might also be a, a driving factor. Very good. Um, you had a, a really interesting emphasis on having, um, on having cryostats. Um, what did you see as the uh, uh, deciding factors for the direction that you, you uh, went in with your cryostats? Um, we wanted them to be as small and as compact as possible um, and also not uh, not have um, any vibration and not um, not have any helium consumption because um, you know helium is a non-renewable resource but it's also incredibly expensive um, locally so um, we were looking for a long time um, we did you know have the typical large um, cold head type recirculating cryostat and, and um, to be fair, um, some of our users were disadvantaged because they were simply not tall enough to load the sample in. So, you know, we I think I think we've found a compromise between a, the small and compact and the um, and the uh, you know efficient, efficient okay. and effective. Okay. Um, will the uh, last question here is will the scientific focus and directions for the existing XAS beamline? change as MEX1 and MEX2 come online? That's that's really to the user community. So we don't tend to dictate, you know, the, the, the we don't tend to dictate what can and, be can't, and can and can't be done. Um, the, 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 the three beam lines will work as a, as a cluster. So um, I, I guess we presume that we will look at proposals that come in and then decide which beam line is most suited to um, the right technique, but what having the the new bending magnet beam lines does is it allows the the existing beam line to focus more on areas where it's really going to shine. And so, for example, having um, high resolution spectroscopy and really utilizing that flux that that's going to be a key key driver. But you can't do that while you're three times oversubscribed with bread and butter experiments that really you know matter to our community. 